approach our third lesson through the epistle to Titus out of four lessons. You guys will recall that in the uh, last few weeks we've talked about an introductory to Titus. We've talked about the central theme of Titus, which is the grace of God, which leads to godliness. In chapter one, we saw how godliness begins with godly leaders, and we saw how the Apostle Paul uh, laid out to Titus the qualifications of a godly elder. And we talked about how Titus was an emissary and companion of the apostles, and how the Apostle Paul appointed him to the city of Crete to um, get the churches established there, to get leadership established, and to finish the work that Paul had started. Last week in chapter 2, we saw that godliness was for every believer in God's household. And in the first part of chapter 2, we looked at the various manifestations of godliness for every group in the household of God. This week, as, as Paul, or excuse me, as Brad pointed out, what a compliment, Brad. As, as Brad uh, pointed out, we are in our, our key verse of the epistle this week, or our key passage, which is verses 11 through 14. And in these passages today, we're going to see how this concept of grace and the concept of godliness unite. There's a, a word that we commonly use that conveys something very powerful, and that word is incentive. Incentive is a thing that motivates uh, or encourages one to do something. Think of all the marvelous accomplishments that we've made as the human race um, because of incentives of various kinds. For example, look at airplanes. Who would have ever thought that one day mankind would develop airplanes that we would travel in them, all born from the incentive to travel more efficiently? Look at the advancements in medicine that we've made, to, born from the incentive of healing illnesses and, and prolonging life. Even in your own life, what is it that, that gets you to crawl out of bed each morning and to go to work? Is it not the incentive to make a living, to better the quality of your life, to support yourself as a human being? We hear a lot about tax incentives that the government offers to you if you donate to charities or if you're starting a business or if you're putting money towards something that will supposedly benefit society around us. During these last two weeks, we've looked at godliness in the local church from leaders as well as from various groups within the church. And we've seen what godliness looks like. But what is it that gives the incentive to perform godliness? What is it that prompts godly living? I believe the proposition of today's verses is that having an understanding of grace is the most powerful incentive for godly living. And in today's passage, we're going to look at three ministries of grace which incentivize godliness. The first uh, incentive for godliness that we're going to see is grace's teaching ministry. You recall at the end of, uh, of our verses last week, uh, the last people group it covered was slaves, and we equated that with employees today. And right after that, Paul goes into this section of verses. A New Testament commentator, Guthrie is his name, in his commentary on the pastoral epistles, says the close connection of this section with the preceding bears out the relationship between theology and ethics in the New Testament. This imposing statement not only contains an epitome of Christian doctrine, but also emphasizes the impossibility of giving practical advice apart from the eternal verities of the Christian faith. The appeal to a theological basis for action is the new factor in Christian ethics. I thought that was a rather profound observation by Guthrie. But the first ministry of grace, which incentivizes godliness, is its teaching ministry. Grace teaches us how we ought to live on this earth. The first word we see in verse 10, or excuse me, verse 11, is for. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The word for, whenever you see a for in scripture, ask yourself, what is it there for? Because usually... The writer of scripture is connecting what he's about to say with what he has just previously stated. So it's a conjunction that we call logical explanatory, and it draws a direct connection to what Paul had just said. 
And the last phrase he makes in verse 10 was that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So I think now Paul's going in to develop this phrase, God, our Savior, and gives a, a look at the nature of God's saving grace. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. In the last two sessions, I've defined grace. I said grace is the undeserved favor of God towards mankind. A theological definition of grace could be all of the blessings that God is free to bestow upon us as sinners because of Christ's work on the cross. Grace is expressive of God's free favor in Christ in dealing with man's sin. And grace is intrinsic to God's very nature and character. It is exclusively because he is gracious and merciful and loving and kind that he offers redemption to us sinful, unworthy creatures. Grace, by definition, is something that you cannot work for, something you cannot earn, something you do not deserve. And it's entirely on a grace basis that God relates to the human race. I remember when I was uh, in high school and in college, I used to work for a bicycle shop down in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, I was a bike mechanic as well as a bike salesman. I was a real avid cyclist at the time, and I really enjoyed um, that job. And it was usually in college in between semesters that I would be working there. And I remember uh, one particular occasion at the end of winter break. I was, it was my last day of work, and I was going to head back up to Wyoming to go back to school. And I remember my boss, Lee, gave me my last check. And he told me on the last check, I gave you an extra day's pay on there. Not that I worked an extra day, not that I worked a bunch of overtime, not that I was that exceptional of an employee that I deserved it, but Lee, out of his own kind nature, gave me an extra day's pay uh, just to bless me, I suppose, as I went back to school. That was an act of grace. There was nothing I did to earn that or deserve that, and it reflected who Lee was, not who I am. So there's no cause for God to be gracious to us other than his kind nature. Grace is when you bless someone else even when they don't deserve it or when they deserve it least. Do you recall uh, ever maybe loaning somebody money and they want to go to pay you back and you tell them, you know what, don't worry about it, just keep the money. Or have you ever seen somebody on the side of the road who ran out of gas or has a flat tire and you pull over to help them and after you help them out and you're leaving, you don't expect a payment from them. You don't expect anything from them. You just did that to help them out out of kindness. That is what grace is. Grace is unearned and undeserved. And God saving us and redeeming us as sinners is perhaps the most glaring expression of grace that's ever been manifested in all of time. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 2 where Paul says quite a bit about the grace of God in saving us. Ephesians 2, starting from verse 4, and the scripture is on the board as well. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together, and made us to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In Romans 11, Paul says, if it was on the basis of works, then grace would no longer be grace. And if it's... Uh, and vice versa, if it's on the basis of grace, then there's no way it is by works, right? If it was by works, that would mean we earned it, that would mean we could boast about it, that would mean we deserved it, but there is nothing that we can do to earn or deserve God's salvation. You notice in these passages how it emphasizes God's kindness toward us, towards us, his mercy, and it expresses his attributes. And in sending his son to die for us, there's been no greater expression of who God is, both in justice and in love and in grace than all that he's done in Christ for us. The word salvation, it says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, and the word salvation has to do with deliverance from the wrath of God. Since Jesus took the wrath that we deserved on the cross by God's grace, we can be forgiven and delivered from all 
judgment. Jesus says in John 5, Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. What a wonderful passage that ensures to us that we will not face judgment, that we have eternal life right now as we stand. And, and this salvation that Christ has, has undergone for us is available to all people. It says it has appeared to all men. Hubert, another commentator, says, In the Greek, has appeared, stand emphatically at the beginning, stressing the manifestation of grace as a historical reality. The reference is to Christ's entire earthly life, his birth, life, death, and resurrection. The, the verb epiphane, from which we derive our word epiphany, means to become visible, to make an appearance, and conveys the image of grace suddenly breaking in on our moral darkness like the rising sun. Men could never have formed an adequate conception of that grace apart from its personal manifestation in Christ, in his incarnation and atonement. Notice the verse says that this grace which brings salvation has appeared to all men, and it seems to imply universalism. Does this mean all people are saved? It does not imply that. And in fact, I think the new uh, international version of the NIV conveys the verse most accurately as far as the concept is concerned. In the NIV, it says, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And what the passage signifies is that Christ died for all sins of all people, and therefore anybody who believes in him can have eternal life. There are certain sects of theology that teach Jesus only died for a specific group of people, um, or for, only died for believers. Uh, that's just simply not true. The scriptures are explicit in their declaration that Christ died for all. We call this the doctrine of unlimited atonement. Look at what it says in 1 John 2.2. 2. It says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Pretty clear to me, isn't it, to you guys? 1 Timothy 4.10. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. Now, if he's the Savior of all men, even those who don't believe, then that must imply that he died for the whole world. The only thing is, it has to be appropriated through faith in Jesus Christ. Just because Jesus died for the whole world doesn't mean the whole world is automatically saved. It means the possibility is there. And anyone who places their trust in Jesus Christ will be saved. Think about it for a moment. In Scripture, the basis of one's eternal condemnation is their rejection, their resolute refusal to believe in Jesus Christ. And if Jesus didn't die for the whole world, then upon what basis does God condemn them? How can they reject something that Christ didn't offer them? But rather, they are condemned for rejecting the salvation that he underwent for them. And they choose instead to stand on their own merit instead of on Christ's merit. And our own merit is never enough to appease a righteous and holy God. That is the, the essence of the gospel message. So we saw a little bit in this first part of verse 11 about the nature of grace and how it was manifested in salvation. Now we see the teaching ministry of grace. It's teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Notice it says that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Again, the central theme of Titus is the grace of God which leads to godliness. Godliness, I would say, is godlikeness, that which is like God in our behaviors and actions. And so ungodliness would be the antithesis to that. All that is opposed to God. Worldly lusts have to do with the lust of this world. And remember, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's called the God of this world. He has, since the fall of man, Satan has assumed relative authority over this earth to, to promote his agenda. Until, and God allows him to do this until Christ will return and overthrow him. And God will establish his eternal kingdom. But this present world system is corrupt and it's decadent and it reflects all things that are opposed to God and is dominated by a satanic agenda. This is why in James, I guess I don't have it in the PowerPoint, sorry about that. In James 1.27, it says, Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, 
to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted or unstained from the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, that one we do have on the board. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So this world system is diametrically opposed to all that is of God and his word. And we are called to live in this world, but not of this world. Even as Christ said, I am not of this world, so should we say the same thing. So it gives a negative, we shouldn't do these things, we shouldn't live in ungodliness, we shouldn't live in worldly lust. But then it gives, tells us what we should do, how we should live is in sobriety, in righteousness, in godliness. This word sober, again, we've seen it several times throughout the epistle of Titus thus far, and we've had comments on it each week. But it means self-control, prudence, restraint. We see the same word used in Titus 2.2, 2, speaking of older men. It has, to, it has to do with being wise in your thinking. The phrase, you are what you think, is absolutely correct. And all input has output. All of the input that we put in our mind will eventually manifest itself in some way, either in our thinking, in our words, or in our action. A lot of people have understood this concept. For example, during the Vietnam War, when the Vietnamese would capture prisoners, they would, in the Vietnamese prisons, they allowed them to read certain books, but only communist literature. So if there was a Bible found or something, of course it was to be destroyed. Anything that promoted democracy was to be destroyed. Anything that promoted freedom. Only communist literature could be read. Why do you think that is? Because if you're sitting in a prison and all you can do is read and all you're reading is communist literature over and over again, that's going to be the worldview you start to adopt. What this word soberly implies is we're thinking with God's viewpoint. We put the right things in our mind and we think with soundness and with clearness to discern the will of God. Next, grace teaches us to live righteously. This has to do with uprightness. We know that the moment we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, God took the perfect righteousness and merit of his Son and imputed it or credited it to us. So we have the righteousness of Christ that we stand on before God. And I believe when the scriptures talk about an experiential righteousness like this, it is when we're walking by the Spirit, that righteousness, Christ's righteousness that we stand on is being displayed in our outward conduct. Next, it says godliness, which means to live like God, which of course can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, walk by the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So, uh, to live like God can only be done when we're filled with the Spirit. These verses instruct us positively to live sensibly, which is self-controlled self -controlled inwardly. They tell us to live righteously, which is morally upright outwardly, and to live godly, which is reverently upwardly in this present age. You notice the last phrase in our verse says, the present age. There are a variety of interpretations of, of what is meant by age. One of them is that age is a reference to the dispensation of the church, the current divine administration that we are in as believers in the body of Christ till Jesus returns in the rapture and takes us off the earth. And that's definitely a possible explanation. I think what Paul's emphasizing here, though, is age as, as this evil world system. We're in Satan's world system until we're taken off the earth. He, he speaks of this also in Galatians 1.4 when he says, speaking of Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. But nonetheless, no matter which interpretation you fall on, the outcome is the same. We're to live soberly, righteously, godly until Christ takes us and this age is no more. The first ministry of grace that incentivizes godliness is its teaching ministry. The next ministry of grace is its ministry of encouragement. Grace encourages us of what's to come. Look at verse 13. It says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Looking for the blessed hope. 
The scriptures teach that Christ can return at any moment, any day. We call this the doctrine of imminence. The rapture is imminent. Christ could return for his church at any moment. And if you're living each day ready for Christ's return, looking and anticipating his return for us in the rapture, then you will be ready for anything. This first word here, looking, is in the present tense, and it, and it connotes a continuous action. We're continuously looking. The first thing that came to my mind was Hebrews 12, 2, which says, looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. That is who we're to be occupied with, is Jesus Christ, as we finish the race of the Christian life, anticipating his return. Perhaps there's no more encouraging of a doctrine than the doctrine of the rapture or our blessed hope. This word um, hope we use a lot in our everyday English. We say, I hope the Broncos win the Super Bowl or I hope it doesn't hail outside tomorrow. I hope I'm not going to be late to work. But the, in the scriptural sense, it carries a totally different meaning. Hope in the scriptural sense has to do with confident expect expectation or a certain expectation of a guaranteed result. And that guaranteed result is when Christ meets us in the air and perfects us forever. We won't have time today to, to go through the New Testament and look at a variety of passages on the rapture, but if you want to jot down 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, the, it's a clear explanation of the rapture of the church. This is another clear passage which teaches the imminent return of Christ. Where you look, where your eyes are fixed, is going to determine the direction that you are going. Um, think about it for a minute. Have you ever been walking and you're staring at something off to the side and before you know it, your course is getting crooked? Um, this is why Jesus says the eye is the lamp of the body, right? What our eyes are fixed on is going to determine the direction and the momentum that our life goes. And if our eyes are fixed on the, the return of Christ, if that's what we're living for each day and that's what we're ready for, perhaps there's no better incentive for godliness than that. This concept of hope in uh, Romans 8 it says, for we, in Romans 8, 24 and 25, it says, for we are saved in this hope, in this confident expectation. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Colossians talks about Christ in us, the hope of glory. And when Christ returns for us in the rapture, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, he's going to transform our bodies. He's going to perfect us. He's going to glorify us. And we are going to be like him, the scriptures teach. In 1 John 2, verses tw in verse 28, it says, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. A few verses later in chapter 3, it says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in, himself, in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Knowing that Christ can return at any moment is tremendous incentive for godly living. Christ here is called Great God and Savior. This is one of the clearest passages in the New Testament on the deity of Christ. We talked about that today in our um, adult Bible study before the service. We talked about the deity and the humanity of Christ. Um, but this is a good one to remember if you're ever disputing with somebody who doesn't believe Jesus is God. This is a very clear reference to that. Also, verses like John 1.1, 1, 1, um, John 20.28, 20, Hebrews 1, 8 through 13, 1 John 5, 20, among many, many others. Those are very clear passages to keep note of, or at least remember the reference if you're ever in conversation. Someone cannot understand and appreciate and believe in Jesus' work if they don't understand that he is the divine son of God. If he was just another man, his work would be no more significant than any of ours. So the second ministry of grace which incentivizes godliness is its, great, its ministry of encouragement. We're encouraged of what's to come. The third and final ministry which incentivizes godliness is it reminds. 
Grace reminds us of why God saved us. It reveals to us Christ's intent when he redeemed us. Verse 14 says, Who gave himself that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. In other words, what this passage is teaching is that Christ did not give himself as a sacrifice and die for us just merely to deliver us from God's wrath. But he gave himself to transform us, to give us a new life, to give us the ability to commune with God and to serve him and to live a life pleasing to him. It is absolutely impossible for mankind to please God or to serve God or to be transformed if he does not have the life and the righteousness of Christ. So Christ came to not only save us, but to transform us. It says here that he delivered us, or excuse me, he's redeemed us from every lawless deed and purified for himself as on special people. When it says he gave himself for us, this has to do, I believe, with he gave himself as a sacrifice. This is looking at the cross when he gave himself to bear our sins. And more precisely, he gave himself as a substitutionary sacrifice. In other words, he died in our place. The Bible says he bore our sins in his own body on the cross. The scriptures say that God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Then it says that, that introduces a purpose clause, gives the purpose for why he gave himself, that he might redeem us from every, every lawless deed. The doctrine of redemption we see implied here, and uh, there's a few different Greek words for redeem in the New Testament. This particular one means to release on receipt of ransom. And the fundamental idea of redemption is Christ has purchased us out of the slave market of sin. And the idea here is that we were in the slave market of sin. Christ purchased us with his own blood, and he goes to the slave, the slave owner, shows the receipt of, of payment for us, and delivers us from that slavery. So he redeems us from every lawless deed, every sinful action we are freed from. Remember, Christ says, know the truth and the truth will set you free. And whomever the Son sets free is free indeed. So he has freed us from all sin and lawlessness so we can live lives that are acceptable to him. And if that is not a powerful incentive for godliness, then I don't know what is. Notice here that God doesn't demand godliness or, or else he's going to punish and destroy us but rather he, he's expressed his love and his grace towards us, and he wants us to reciprocate that love and pursue him out of love and out of gratitude, not out of fear and compulsion. God wants a relationship with us. It says in order to purify for himself, Christ has purified us from all of our impurities, from all of our wrong, from all of our sin. The word means to consecrate by cleansing. It's the same word used in 1 John 5, 7, which says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, purifies us from all sin. Christ wants us to be a purified people to represent him on this earth. It says we are a special people in the passage. This has to do with the fact that he's set us apart. He has sanctified us to be his people on this earth. Griffin, another commentator, says the highest and purest motivation for Christian behavior is not based on what we can do for God, but rather upon what God has done for us and yet will do. Having an understanding of grace is the most powerful incentive for godly living. I believe this reflects a little bit of what happened when God called Israel out. And he, told, he entered a covenant relationship with Israel and said, It is through you that I'm going to disclose myself to the world. You will be my representatives on this earth. He tells Israel in Deuteronomy 14, 2, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Now, even though the church, the New Testament church, is not Israel, and we are not currently fulfilling Israel's promises, we are Christ's representatives on this earth during this time, just as the nation of Israel was in the Old Testament. And the product of this is that we should be zealous for good works. Do you recall last week we saw this phrase, good works, and I mentioned how it's 
It's in the book of Titus six times in this short three-chapter epistle. And again, when a writer keeps phrasing something over and over again, that means he's emphasizing that phrase. Good works have to do with the godliness that we have as a result of abiding in Christ, as a result of having the right orientation to grace. And you guys may recall last week, I gave a personal definition for good works that basically said they were the natural byproduct of fellowshipping with God produced by the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, abide in me and I in you, and you will bear much fruit. This, this idea, this... Um, parallel of grace and, and godliness or grace producing good works in us is seen all over the New Testament. And again, it has to do with the fact God saved us by grace, not only to save us, but also that he may transform us and make us like his son. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. C.I. Schofield, perhaps some of you have heard of the Schofield Study Bible, he says in there that verses 11 through 14 are notable for their perfect balance of doctrine with living. They relate this doctrine to a life that denies evil and practices good here and now, that sees in the return of Christ the incentive for godly conduct, and that realizes in personal holiness and good works the purpose of the atonement. The passage is one of the most concise summations in the entire New Testament of the relation of gospel truth to life. In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 15, I think Paul appeals to us on a similar basis. He says, for the love of Christ compels us. Some translations say constrains us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Is the love of Christ constraining or compelling you to pursue him in a relational way? Is the love of Christ constraining you to want to serve God, to have a life of godliness? Is having this understanding of all grace, all God has done for us in grace, enough incentive to live for him? Again, the proposition is having an understanding of grace is the most powerful incentive for godliness. I don't remember his name. One commentator I read said that if a believer is not walking in godliness, it's either because he does not understand these things or because he does not believe them. What a provocative thought, huh? Finally, gratitude is the primary motivator for godly living, a gratitude for all that God has done for us in grace, not out of fear, not out of compulsion. But God has chosen to call us and and chosen for us to live with him in a relational way. And and godliness will flow naturally out of that. People will see it in our lives, and it will manifest Christ to others. Will you bow your heads with me as I close in prayer? Father, thank you so much for your amazing, amazing grace, which did all of the work for us so that we could stand complete in your son, Jesus Christ. May we be compelled by this love that he has expressed, that we no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died for us and rose again. For it's in the name of Jesus Christ that I pray. Amen.